So we are physically modeling a situation in which a person crouches 20 centimeters and then jumps 80 centimeters off the ground. So what does that give us? So we know that this is a bad chunk. We know that the crouch distance is centimeters below his original height. So something like this is my original height. I crouch, this is 20 centimeters, not to scale. So then he manages to jump a distance of 0.8 meters or 80 centimeters above the ground. So our goal here is let's first draw a little diagram of what's happening. So let's say this is point A, he's on the ground, then at point B, he makes the jump and then at point C, he reaches a maximum height. So we're going to find the time, the velocity, and the acceleration time from uh, starting from when he jumped at location A, location B, and location C. So of course, at location C, we can already figure out that this is going to be zero because it's at maximum height, which means it can't go upwards anymore. So that means that the vertical velocity over here is zero. I guess I'll write that. And meanwhile, here, A, we know the time is zero because that's the instant we jump off the ground. And for these other two, we know that the net acceleration is simply going to be g, negative 9.8, or in this case, to make it do That's no not point. negative 10 at B. You have to have a loss of acceleration. That's A. Oh, you, okay, sure, uh, okay. So, uh, at B and C, we already know the net acceleration. Oh, B is, he's already in the air? Yeah. Okay, can you put uh, next to B, he's already in the air? Next to B. Air, ground. Okay. So, why is it not negative 10 for A? Well, think about it. If it was negative 10 for A, this guy can never get off the ground. The net force has to be unbalanced in some way so that he's able to propel himself upward. And if the net force is unbalanced, that means the acceleration changes so that he can lift himself in the positive direction, which means this is greater than zero, but we don't know its actual value le yet. So we'll leave that for later. Now we have to actually start focusing. So first of all, we already know the initial velocity at A is still zero because, you know, he's crouching. He's just gotten off the ground. But we have to figure out this. Now, how do we figure that out? Well, we treat him like a projectile that just went up and down and reached, him, reached the maximum height of 0.8 meters. And what's the distance over time function of this projectile? Well, it's VIT, VI being the thing that we're trying to find, so we can substitute it in here, plus half A, which is, of course, negative 10, T squared. So now, we know that its maximum height is 0 0.8. So let's actually find it this way. At the maximum point of ascent, we know that VY has to be equal to zero, and this is also equal to VI plus AT. So we get VI minus 10, T is equal to zero. So that means VI is equal to 10, T. And I'll call this T naught to stand for the point in which this happened. So then we have D equals VIT plus half AT squared, So minus 5t squared, and we know the maximum height is 0 0.8, so 
So now we plug in the fact that that time was exactly equal to vi over 10. To get vi times vi over 10 squared minus 5 times vi. Wait. Oh, oh, crap. I'm dumb. Sorry. Okay. So we get 0 0.8 is equal to 0 0.1 vi squared minus, let's see, that is 0 0.05 vi squared, which means we get 0 0.8 is equal to 0 0.05 vi squared, which means that this is going to be multiplied by 20. So that gives us 16 as vi squared, which means vi is equal to 4 meters per second. All right, so that's how we managed to pull out the initial velocity. So the velocity is split second after he uh, jumps off the ground. So now, well. Baby, you can erase all the work in order to do other work. Except the table. A and B are kind of indistinguishable. But, I mean, to find that, uh, you have to know the time between him crouching and him finally getting off of the ground, which we don't know. So we'll just leave it there, which means we also can't calculate this, unless we're given a time, like, say, half a second. But uh, we'll treat that as it is later. So now, how do we find C? Well, I mean, that's just initial velocity divided by 10. So that gives us, yeah, yeah, okay. So he should reach his maximum point of ascent in 0 0.4 seconds. So now, how do we figure out V? Well, we can't know it without knowing the difference between when he crouches like this and when he actually starts jumping off the ground. So let's pretend it's 0 0.5 seconds, for example. Wait. Uh, that would make this 0.9 seconds if we're adding this on top of it. And we make this 0 0.5 seconds, since that's the point at which it first launches into the air. So then, what we should get is just the change in velocity divided by acceleration, which gives us no, it's actually 40 meter per second squared. That's only if this is 0.1. No, first find the acceleration there by using kinematics. Vf squared is equal to Va squared plus 280. Oh, yeah. I Oh, that's why. <sighs> sorry, I'm dumb. It's my, it's my fault. Okay, sorry. Um, bad mistake. It is those work, baby. You don't need them. So now we know Vf squared is equal to Vi squared, which gives us 160 is equal to 4a, which gives us a is equal to 40 meters per second squared. Huh, that's another reason why I should stick to math. So we get 40 meters per second squared here, which gives us, this is 0 0.4 seconds after we get off the ground. So what is B? Well, it's just 4 divided by 40, the amount of time it takes to make that change, which is 0.1 second. And the time it takes in between B and C is just, as we calculated before, Vi over 10, which is by Vf equals Vi plus At, which means this is 0.1 plus 4, uh, this is 0 0.1 plus 0.4, which is equal to 0.5 seconds. Okay, there we go.